So I'm here with Nadine Baggett, who is going to be doing the Trends 101 with us today. Nadine, what are some trends in skincare that you've seen? I'll take a higher level perspective throughout your career. You've been working in the industry a lot longer than I have. So I've been a journalist since I left university and I've been a health and beauty journalist for 33 years now. And I have seen so many trends come and go, but it can be split into an old school, early 90s, 80s, late 80s, early 90s. It seemed to be a dichotomy then between French mysticism and American science. So we had Chanel and Clarence and Dior selling us the dream of beauty. And then for the first time ever, we were spoken to by a scientist and by formulating chemists by the American companies. So by companies like Clinique, for example, and the Estee Lauder group. We saw the early dichotomy there between cleanse tone, moisturize, and mystery. And then I guess in a way, the beginning was Clinique. So when Norman Oren Trike launched Clinique, and he was the first dermatologist to come and speak to us about the chemistry, the biochemistry of skin and active ingredients, and to introduce us to things like salicylic acid, as opposed to the virgin flower picked at six o'clock, you know, as the sun goes down and the dew is on it, whatever, according to the moon cycles. So there was that split. And that probably happened late 80s, early 90s. And then we just carried on pretty much doing a similar thing. I mean, something like Creme de la Mer would come along and teach us all how to market a product, probably until Brandon Truax with The Ordinary. And that's when the apple cart just got turned up. And that, for me, was the second, after the Derm collection of skincare, it was then the active ingredient-led skincare. And that was when the last revolution in skincare happened. I'm curious, how does the clean movement fit in with all of this? Well, I was going to leave that question to a last, Jane, because you know I'm firmly on your side. I feel that the clean movement is a reaction to probably the Derm-led, active-led skincare movement, because there is that big pharma, conspiracy theory, nature is best conspiracy and myth that goes around in beauty in the same way that it goes around in wellness as well. And for me, I feel that comes from the wellness industry, the blurring of the line between wellness and beauty. I try not to think of it as being a trend. I like to think it's dying miserably, choking (laughs) away in a corner, but that's just you and I, Jen. And now from this what trends were more long lasting and then what were some that were more a flash in the pan kind of trend so i feel that the long lasting one for me would be the the derm led ranges so when clinique first launched and then you think they have basically spawned every single derm led range so we've got sort of mirad and we had revive and we had there are so many ranges And then I feel in a way that that trickled down to the active single ingredient, even though we know we know they're not single ingredients that led down to the the ordinary Dessier and those sort of things. And that's about science. And then on the other side, we have this sort of the goopification of beauty, which comes from the sort of clean anti-science movement, which comes from the wellness movement as well. Both of them appear to be going fairly strong still. It's very interesting. This weekend, I'm working at a a huge aesthetic skincare symposium and wellness is a huge part of it. And it never fails to amaze me that people that have Botox and filler and lasers also believe in balancing their chakras and that sort of stuff. It's very interesting to see that dichotomy with women. Things that come and go. I mean, I think in a way, the, the idea behind a single ingredient that isn't clinically proven. So for example, it could be a rose extract, or it could be, uh, as I said, a a seaweed extract, something that came along and disappeared quite quickly. So I feel like we've sort of exploded that out of the water slightly, along with things like active ingredients. I think the things that have lasted the longest in recent years have been the AEBC SPF. So 20, 30 years ago, nobody was talking about vitamin A, nobody was talking about niacinamide, nobody was talking about vitamin C, We were maybe just talking about antioxidants, but not really. And nobody was talking about using SPFs. We literally used SPFs just on holiday. And whenever I interview anybody my age and they say, oh my goodness, I can't believe I didn't look after my skin. I always say, nobody told us to use SPF 24-7. 
there wasn't that level of skin knowledge 30 or 40 years ago. And SPF was something you literally used on holiday to get a tan to prevent yourself from burning. So that's been a massive movement in the last probably six or seven years. Oh, you bring up so many interesting points. The lasting effect of derm led skincare to what we see today from derm launched brands to brands using derms as their main influencer. And the other thing that you were talking about around ingredient trends, it just reminds me, I had a conversation with Kenton from Gel Tour. He made the comment, and it was in alignment with what you were saying, that there's a shift now from some of the spicy ingredients that we were looking for back to the tried and true ingredients with a lot of evidence behind them. Moving along in this conversation, from your point of view, how has consumer interests changed and how has that impacted what we're seeing today in the cosmetics industry? Again, I think that there is this weird dichotomy with people wanting wellness-based products. So, for example, one of the things coming up at the moment will be the, the gut-brain access. And the, so everybody's been talking about the gut-brain access. Well, in 2024, they're going to be talking about the skin-brain access and these neuro-cosmetics. So about skincare, wellness, feeling good about yourself, all of which is very left-field and not really proven. And then I feel like you have the old-school people who are interested in tried, tested, trusted. So you have ABC, SPF, the things that everybody knows that works. And what's interesting is some of those active ingredients, they show no sign of waning. And I think it's probably because they do have clinicals behind them. Yeah. And then I'm also thinking about consumer perceptions regarding product safety, cleanliness. Is this something new? It's very interesting because we went into lockdown and at a time when sort of science and this whole drift towards or there should have been a shift towards listening to science and to the science educators, there still seems to be this conspiracy theory disbelief in big pharma and big science and all that sort of stuff, which is ironic because the wellness industry is worth so much more than the, the pharmaceutical industry in terms of money making. So I still think there is that dichotomy and beauty between tried, tested, trusted, ABC, SPF, and then everything else. And that fundamental distrust of chemicals, of science, of all that sort of of doctors. So there is still this. So just like you have people who are anti-vax and vaccine, and then you so also you have clinical trial science and anti-clinical trial science. And I just feel that's a massive thing that's still splitting the beauty industry. Yeah, I guess people are all looking for silver bullets and looking for things to fill the gap in the spaces that modern medicine and pharmaceuticals have left or modern science really has left. And so people feel that they're being not adequately treated from their primary physician. And so they're looking for an alternative. And people feel like, well, the solutions that I'm given on this one side is taking really long time to achieve the goals that I want to achieve. But now this other side is saying, well, if you just take this pill, then give it a week and you're going to XYZ that's being claimed by supplements. It's not only results driven though it's service driven because if we think that the within the UK the NHS is stretched GPs don't have any time they don't have time to soft soap and look after you and in a way if you think about over the counter skincare it's just saying use a retinoid use a vitamin c use a niacinamide use an spf they might not even feel good let's be honest here Ginseuticals, uh, C for Ulic is like, as my friend Claire Coleman says, like putting liquid marmite on your face. It's not a pleasant experience. I put my faith in the science that it will deliver as an antioxidant to brighten my skin, to boost collagen, whatever. If you don't want that sort of skincare, you're also a person that is looking for a wellness journey. You're looking for a sensorial journey that fulfills something else. I don't care if my skincare is pleasant to use. I want it to be clinically proven. But if you want to buy into a product that will rebalance your chakras, then you are suspending your disbelief because you want that journey. So in a way, it's a sort of soul searching journey, as opposed to mine, which is just slap it on, get to work and hope for the best. I think there are direct correlations between what's happening in beauty and what's happening in health, without a doubt. What are some of today's trends in the beauty sector? Why have they 
caught on and what are your general thoughts of them? There are so many and I've got them written down here. So you know that I think the ingredient led formulation is still dominating the landscape. When you have people like who wouldn't even normally speak in these terms, like Elizabeth Arden talking about hydroxypenacolone retinoate and, and, you know, trying to polish that one off, even though it's been available for ages. I find that very interesting because they're not a company that were originally, with the exception of ceramides. That, and even then, when they launched ceramides, they didn't really talk about them as an active ingredient. So you have that, which is still a core, and you have clean, which is still a core. I think in the UK, I still think there is a massive influence from lockdown of JK skincare, so Japanese and Korean-led skincare. And we're looking to them for new ingredients. And I think that comes from a time during lockdown when we had a lot of time on our hands and we could have 10 step skincare and we were all on Zoom and things like that. So you have a, a lot of the active ingredients. So for example, like Sika is a, is a huge one and tiger grass is coming out of there. And then the polynucleotides, we know that they're being injected into the skin in the UK. Well, they're available in skincare already. It just happens to come from Japan and Korea. And I think that's really interesting. And that signs, shows no sign of going. And then in the UK in particular, we have a South Asian diaspora. So we have, especially within hair care, but it's moving into skincare now, is we're seeing a lot of those old traditions. So, for example, turmeric in skincare, which comes from the way that the South, South Asians used it. So we have Bangladeshi, Indian and Pakistani diasporas here that are also looking to go back to what their mother and their grandmother used. And I think it's really interesting because I think what the beauty industry is looking for is the next holistic non-Western medical trend. So where we've had JK and now we've got the South Asian diaspora, I think they'll be looking for indigenous skincare rituals and actives. That seems to be the next big thing. So whereas when I was a beauty editor, I was sold into the mystique and mystery of the French industry and we've got a whole generation growing up with Japanese Korean the next thing could for example be Native American or it could be Brazilian rainforest if you want to wrap an active in some sort of level of mystery and mysticism that I feel is where the beauty industry is looking for its next big trend so that will probably be into 2025 and beyond but what's happening in 2024 is you've got the biomimetic ingredients like the enzyme sirtuins Lauder are going to be all over that. They're looking at four particular particular sirtuins in skincare in 2024. You've got a repurposing of sensitized skin as being overprocessed skin. So that barrier function thing is still going to be massive. And ironically, even though I look to the ordinary as, as democratizing skincare, I do feel like it's that overuse of actives that's led to this obsession with barrier repair. And it being reworked this year as being overprocessed skin. Instead of overprocessed hair, we have overprocessed skin. Yeah. And I guess like a couple other things that I see from like the formulator perspective, there's so much competition right now. So everyone's looking for that point of differentiation. One way I see companies differentiating more because consumers are starting to demand this more. And I think this is from like this like education revolution from SciCommerce coming online to talk about cosmetic sciences. This demand for substantiation, so more substantiation, how are you actually proving what you're doing? And then the other thing that I've seen really gain a lot of traction is biotech. It's more for the ingredient side of things. And certainly it's been with us for like the dawn of the cosmetic sector, like hyaluronic acid has been there for a long time or xanthan gum. One of those ingredients that's been here for a long time, but now there's so much innovation in the biotech space in really interesting and novel ways, more on the ingredient side. But I think that you'll see more of it for finished products as a consumer. I think you're right about the testing. And I think the people that are most active and angry about existing testing is we need to talk about skin testing equity. So there's a massive argument now that why are we just testing on six white women? It makes no sense at all. So I think skin Clinical equity will be a huge thing moving forward, and it has to be because we've been talking about equity and diversity within the beauty industry for ages. And RIP Amaris. How can Amaris have gone in 2023? That breaks my heart. And that also reminded me of a few conversations I've had within IBA, Independent Beauty Associations 
membership, particularly Kelly from Beauty Matter, talking about the rise in bankruptcies. I don't know if we're necessarily in a recession, but like cosmetic sector, it's not recession proof, despite what people will say. And we've been seeing this with this rise in bankruptcies. So maybe that's a unfortunate trend that's currently happening. What trends do you like and not like that you see out there right now? And then what do you predict will be a skincare trend in the coming years and why? I mean, I'm obviously going to say I like science-based actives that are proven to work. And I that's what I use every single day. So I'm going to say it again, ABC, SPF. I mean, that's me. I'm happy. I'm done. I don't need new actives. I just need nicer ways to use them. Thank you, Stephen, and your vitamin C. I think that the, my biggest issue with the industry is anything that is clean, safe, non-toxic, scaremongering from all those people that spread that around. It still drives me absolutely mad. And I can't bear it when brands come and say that their products are clean or safe. Or There are two things. There's the sort of wellness goop and then there's the clean safe goop and it just is an instant turn off for me the trends i've seen coming are the blurring of the lines between aesthetics and skincare and i i hinted about this earlier on so you've got things like the skin boosters the exosomes the polynucleotides and it's interesting that they have a nod to natural to appease some so for example the salmon nucleotide but the way that some skincare companies are beginning to deliver them with at-home gadgets like microneedling, for example. So you have this huge growth with using biomimetic or autologous ingredients from yourself. So I think it's very interesting that I think that moving forward, and I, for me, this is still science fiction, but a lot of brands are trying to do it. You've got like growth factors and stem cells and you have we all remember the scare about Revive, but you've got TNS recovery serum and stuff like that. And I feel like they were the early adopters of what will be coming. And I went to a, a huge Galderma conference in Miami, and that's all the dermatologists were speaking about. How can they get these active ingredients that they're injected into skin into skincare? And if you would combine it with microneedling, how can we get it into the skin? In the UK, we have a massive rise in direct dermatology pharmac pharmacy services because we just simply don't have enough dermatologists. I think that will be huge. That shows no sign of abating. We have body care that delivers, so active-led body care, which for me would be ABC, SPF as well, although the e -regulation, EU regulations are about to stamp down on high levels of actives for leave-on body products. Now, there's a lot with trends. There's so many trends out there. I would imagine for a brand, it's really hard to navigate this, to know like, how do you stay on top of trends? How do you find that point of differentiation? So I'm going to ask this as a two pronged question directed both to brands and then also then to consumers. Do you have any suggestions for brands navigating skincare trends, especially as they're in that product development phase. And then the second part, suggestions for consumers who are looking at all the trends out there, what should they actually buy into from your perspective? I think for a brand, it must be very hard not to jump on every single new trend because the drive for newness is actually being driven by the retailer. What's new? What's happening? What's next? And that puts so much pressure on skincare brands in a way that just didn't happen 30 years ago. I would say try to resist what's new and what's exciting and stick by what your core values are. So for me, it would be tried, tested, trusted ingredients that actually work and make them more sensorial, make them more pleasurable to use. Because I think the gap in the market is between products that are pleasurable to use and don't really deliver and active-led skincare that often can be unpleasant. And I think what's interesting for me, I can already see it happening now, is there's a little bit of a backlash to layering individual ingredients. So people just want a nice antioxidant serum or a nice night cream with a retinol already on it. They don't really want to layer on serums now. I think they're a hardcore group that will still layer on different active ingredients, but most people want to go back to multi-action, multi ingredient led products which we would have had 20 30 or years ago but with active ingredients that actually work so that they promise lots and they deliver and to a consumer i would say engage critical thinking before you fall for anything basically say it's very interesting so 
I've been a journalist for 32 years, and I think the beauty industry feeds and influencing feeds on a new generation of naive, not necessarily poorly educated, but non-questioning, gullible people to believe every single new hype. And it's because we don't want to think that anybody lies to us. We don't want to think that brands lie to us or formulating chemists, not that you ever get to speak to them anymore, but we used to. We don't want to think that marketeers lie to us. And I think there are about four of us in the UK that ask the awkward questions. Everybody else just believes what they're told. And I feel like you're doing a disservice. And maybe this comes with age because I'm 61 now and I've been there, seen it, done it. I've seen the trends come and go. But I think remember who your audience are and and I think just try to deliver within your remit of what you can do. And as a consumer, just remember that it's skincare. It's not a miracle worker. And don't believe anybody that sells you a magical, you know, Emperor's New Clothing, one size fix all, Augustinus Bader. <laughs> Basically, the new creme de la mer marketing book. They just, I just think when you're young, I think you can believe that the perfect product exists and it doesn't exist. And you only realise that when you get older, which is when you become more sceptical and more questioning. Question everything. Question everything. Full heartedly agree. And so, oh, this was such an interesting perspective from the journalist perspective. So very, I don't know, interesting to me from my own perspective formulating. If you guys in the audience have questions for Nadine, now's the time and we'll head into Q&A.